Church, we're going to continue worshiping together by hearing the story uh, of a special couple in our community. Caleb and Robin first came to me to introduce this group. They called it Super Tuesdays, which is an awesome name for a group. And I said, what are you guys going to do? And they're like, well, on Tuesdays, we're going to get together. We're going to eat spaghetti because it's the literal cheapest thing we can serve some young adults. And, uh, and we're each going to have a copy, an old copy of a commentary on a book of the Bible. And we're each going to take one commentary, read it, and be ready to present like that commentator's perspective on that chapter of the Bible and doing it a book at a time. We're going to start with Ecclesiastes. And I said, that's a terrible idea, and the group is never going to work. Seven years later, I'd love for you to hear their story. I'm Caleb, and this is Ooze. I'm Robin. We moved to Michigan about eight years ago. Um, we have lived lots of places over our married life. And this is the longest we've ever been in one place. That is true. Ever. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, and in moving lots of different times, some of our moves were for very defined periods of time. We were going to be in a particular city or whatever for two years, three years. Mm -hmm. And we often always moved knowing nobody where we were going. Mm -hmm. And so our best way of getting to know people, building community, and then growing in our faith was to find a church and dive in head first. Join a group ASAP. <laughs> yep. Yep. Super Tuesday is the small group that um, we've led for the last seven years. Yep. Um, and they meet in our home and we meet on Tuesday nights. That's why it's Super Tuesday. And we usually share dinner together unless it's a pandemic. And then we um, talk about a passage of the Bible that we've all read. Um, there are times when we're gone for one reason or another and we still meet, we sometimes still meet in our house. Mm -hmm. um, it's the best night of the week. Yeah. When yeah. I say doing life together, I mean um, sharing our hopes, um, sharing our sadnesses, talking about um, the things in our lives that hurt, um, but also the things in our lives that are going well, um, and supporting each other in those things. Well, we were talking last night about who do you text when you have gone to the car place and uh, you are not, you don't have a ride home now because they've taken your car. Um, and you text the group text and you say, can anybody pick me up? Otherwise I'm here for four hours and somebody can come pick you up. Groups are messy. I think one of the things that can happen to us is you hear about someone's good group experience and then you go to group and it's a bunch of weirdos um, and you never want to go back or you go and it's an awkward time or childcare doesn't work out, whatever it is, groups are really messy. And because it didn't work the first time, you think it will never work and you, you don't want to go back. And I would say groups are absolutely worth the effort and to make space for it to be messy for a while. You got to just keep trying groups because people are messy and group is messy, but it is absolutely worth it. I think my hope for people at Encounter is that everyone would have the opportunity to be in a group where they could be known, where they could grow. Um, in the Lord, grow in their relationship with God, but also in their horizontal relationships with other people and really um, get deeper with the people that they share a faith with. Um, I think there's nothing like it. Because that drives you to this idea of spiritual disciplines and that accountability that comes with it. And you just, you can't get that with other things. And when you're tied together with things that actually matter in life, that I think grounds us even more. So I think what I would pray for with Encounter is honestly a heart change for people because I think a lot of people walk in the church, they, can I say they consume for an hour and they walk out. We did that for years when we were in college, when we yep. were younger, it was just, oh, yeah. it's just, it's fine. It's, it was that season of life. But man, when the rubber hits the road and you're out of mom and dad's house and now you have to figure out if this like God thing is real or not. Yeah. When you're kind of flailing out there and you don't have something that can kind of give you guidance, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's something where groups helps you with that spiritual maturity. It's just hard to get a different way. Yeah. Well, welcome, church, to part three of our series, What's the Point of Church? And what we're doing throughout this series is we're taking a closer look at some of the some of the big parts of church. And in this season of evaluation and reevaluation, we're looking at the church and saying, what's the point 
of everything that we do around here. What's the point of worshiping? What's the point of serving last week? What's the point of giving and generosity next week? Today we look at what's the point of groups. And I just want to tell you that my hope, my heart, my aim for this time together is that we would come out of this series with a commitment to worship faithfully, to serve wholeheartedly, to group intentionally today, and to give sacrificially. That's next weekend. Uh, today we talk about grouping intentionally. Two words on there. It has to be intentional. This recognition that we cannot do life alone. And I want to lead you into uh, this conversation today uh, with a true story, with a, with a never been told before in church story about the first and only time that I came home in the back of a police cruiser. Before... Before you like, you know, check out, you know, this guy, like, oh, I'm not listening to him. Like, let me, let me hear, hear me out on the, on the story uh, first. My, my family and I, along with uh, a friend that I invited, I was probably 14, 15 years old, uh, we're vacationing in, uh, in South Florida. Uh, we had rented a house. It was on this like, channel kind of thing that presumably the water would lead out to the ocean somewhere. And the owner of the house left this like rusted out dinghy, right, with an outboard engine on it and some fishing gear. And so my buddy and I, again, 14-year-old geniuses, we're like, all right, we'll use the fishing gear as the excuse to, like, drive this thing around in the ocean. It's going to be amazing. So we, like, load up tackle boxes, fishing pole, other stuff. Neither of us were, like, fisher people at all, right? So we're like, I don't know how this kind of works, but, like, just put everything in the boat, open it up, and, like, let's go. We got out of the channel. We got into the, uh, the open ocean, right, the Gulf of Mexico, and it is awesome, right? Forget about fishing. I mean, we're, like, opening it up and, like, skipping across the waves. We've got the wind in our hair. We've got the open ocean, right? The smell of salty freedom is in the air, we decide somewhere along the ways, like, we should actually try fishing. Well, don't, maybe we'll catch a you know, marlin or a shark or something. Again, 14-year-old genius. has no idea how this works. Of course, we catch nothing, which is probably good because we had no idea what to do with it, even if we did catch something. Uh, we decide, okay, shore is now, as we're drifting out, shore is like this dot on the horizon. We should start it up and, like, head back in. And so I'm the first one to give it a pull. Sputter, sputter, nothing. Small panic, he's like, let me give it a couple of tries. Pull, 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 sputter, 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 nothing. Again and again and again. We keep pulling on this engine, nothing is happening. We can tell that we're moving. We can tell that drift is happening, not bringing us closer to shore. Oh, no, no, that little dot is getting farther and farther out. We have heard of people who have floated their way from Cuba to America. We are going to be the only two Americans who are now floating to Cuba, <laughs> We're terrified, in a panic, figuring out we might as well like start learning Spanish right now. We're never going to make it back to shore. There's one or a single oar in the boat, plus our fishing gear. So after we took turns on the motor, we take turns with the oar, and we're like paddling to get it back. There's no way. My friend notices like this big fluorescent buoy in the water, and he's like, at least if we hang on to that, we won't float to Cuba. It's a good enough idea. So we finally struggle taking turns, get there, and we're holding on. Now we took turns on the motor, we took turns on the oar, and now we're taking turns holding onto this buoy, just waiting and hoping for another boat to come by. An hour or so later, this giant barge comes up, and we're like, don't hit us, but also save us, right? And we're taking turns now, shouting and hooping and hollering, trying to get their attention couple of guys on the barge notice what's happening. They throw us a rope, tow us back to the mainland, back to America. We have no idea where we are. We don't have any idea where we're going, how to call anybody in the place that we're going. So we're standing in front of the payphone because cell phones weren't a thing then. Remember that? And we dialed the only number that both of us had committed to memory, 911. <laughs> and so I was like, 20-something years later, I would like to thank the Clearwater Police Department for bailing me and my friend and our fishing gear out of that particular jam. Never did go back for the dinghy. Never, too many bad memories. Throughout the experience, taking turns pulling on the rope, taking turns on the oar, taking turns hanging on to the buoy, reflecting on the experience, I can tell definitively, I'm glad I wasn't doing that alone. As bad as an experience as it was, thinking that I'm just going to drift out into the ocean and everybody is going to forget about me, as bad as that was, I can definitively say, I'm glad 
I wasn't journeying through that all by myself. That's where we're picking it up today because on a much grander sense than just being stranded out in the ocean by ourselves, in a much grander sense, a lot of us are going through life by ourselves or going through life with very, very few people around. The American Sociological Review found uh, a handful of years ago uh, that the average American has something like uh, two people in their life, two trusted close friends in their life which isn't a lot, especially as an average. What they also found is that a decade earlier, that number was six. Now, that was pre-pandemic numbers. We don't yet know how the last couple of years have impacted that one. But again, they're averages, too, which means some people don't have anybody. Right? As, uh, as Caleb and Robin were sharing in the video, uh, sometimes we need help with something. Some of us, we open up our phones. If you grew up in West Michigan, just about every phone number in your phone starts with a 616 area code of Grand Rapids. There are many of us, especially in this community, who open up their phone and they have nobody around. The American Sociological Review found that if the average is two, one in four people don't have anybody. This is a very dangerous place to live in Camp Hell. There's a lot of reasons. Uh, People have speculated. Maybe it's the increased mobility. If you think about it, we live in the most mobile generation of human history. Never before have people moved geographically as much as we do today. And I'm not I'm not coming down, and it's not a criticism at all. It's just an observation of the reality. Millennials today, we, we hang out for about three years on average in a particular place. It's difficult to develop meaningful, lasting, even lifelong relationships when we're moving every three years. That's just a fact that loneliness, doing life alone, can set in. There's another reality, people have speculated, that modern conveniences have also increased this pandemic of loneliness, that um, the conveniences when homes began to be built with central air and also attached garages is like the switch that flipped and life outside of the home, life migrated from the front porch to the back deck. And what does that do for getting to know our neighbors and the communities and the neighborhoods that we developed? Loneliness begins to set in. It's dangerous to do life alone. I remember as a kid, um, you know, we think about the individual, individualized entertainment that has also come up. I remember as a kid, uh, I, had to, I had to get up early on Saturday mornings to watch Saturday morning cartoons. Like some of you guys remember that? And like, yeah, yeah, because like right around 10.30 a.m., like TV switched from like kid TV to grown-up TV, and it was super boring. And so you had to get up early. You had to like watch whatever was on on one of the four channels that we got in the house. Never had cable, still don't have cable. I'm struggling with that, but you know, I'm therapy, I'm making it, making it through here. Right? But the individualized entertainment now, right? Kids are like, I mean, I just, my kids are like, well, I got I got all the I got all the streaming shows right here. I got YouTube, I got all my favorite people, I got Mark Rober. And what do you mean, Dad? You didn't have Mark Rober. How could you not? What did you watch? I'm like, I, whatever was on, kid. And then when it was done, when it was switched over to grown up TV, I had to go outside and like meet one of the neighbor kids. It didn't matter if we didn't have anything in common. Like, we just had to get to know we were friends because we lived close by. And it's not like a golden age of whatever. I'm just pointing it out as a way to say, like, some of us, we don't have the relationships in our lives because a lot has changed. And so it requires, doesn't it, just that much more level of intentionality to avoid being a part of one of those loneliness statistics. It's dangerous to do life alone. It's so dangerous. In fact, loneliness has been correlated and actually leads to heart disease, stroke, depression, and high blood pressure. In fact, one study recently found that the dangers of experiencing loneliness is on a health level on par with the danger of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's dangerous to do life alone. And so this is where God breaks in with the church and says, like, listen, we've actually got a a built-in solution to this problem. God, as the creator of humanity, knows a thing or two about what we need. And he goes, breaks in with this certain kind of community. But it's not just just any kind of a community. It's a community that has the capacity and has the power to transform our lives. And in the story that we're just about to read, transform our world. We're going to pick up the story in the book of Acts, and you can find that if you want. The words are going to be on the screen, phone-friendly, so you can follow along that way. 
But we pick up the story in Acts when Jesus had just been raised from the dead and he's, he's sharing the Old Testament stories and he's, he's, point, he's pointing out to them how all of those stories point to him, to this story, the resurrection story, as like the apex and the pinnacle of all of creation history. And then he goes up on a side of a hill one time with a bunch of his followers. Luke tells us that there's like 120 of them there and they're on this hill. And then Jesus starts to float. He starts to like, Go up. You know, we don't know if it's like all at once, if it's super quick, or if it's like slowly, but whatever the case is, he starts ascending, and he just keeps going up, and he doesn't stop. Pretty soon, a cloud comes in front, and and they don't see him anymore, and they're just staring, 120 of them, up into the air, kind of just slack-jawed. And these two guys in white come along nearby. It's like this veiled, you know, uh, allusion to, to some angels, and they're like, what are you guys looking at? He's like, are you kidding me? What do you mean? What are we looking at? Jesus, he was here and now he's gone. And the the angels kind of nearby are like, oh, he's gone. Yeah. But he's coming back. Don't worry. He's coming back just like he left. But, you know, it's going to be a while. And so confused, 120 of them are like gathered in Jerusalem because Jesus said, don't leave until, you know, I tell you to. And they're like, what are we waiting for? Well, like these little flames, right? These little little pillars, little bits of fire rest on like head to head to head to head to head. And and people start, these guys start speaking in different languages. And it's not like gibberish because it's Passover, it's Jerusalem. And people have come from all over the world. And and now they're here and they they can hear these stories in their own language. And so Peter like that Peter, the guy like denied Jesus to a little girl three times. Peter stands up and boldly shares the hope in Jesus and the death and resurrection. And in him, we too can, can experience life eternally with him on forever after. And it says that 3,000 people were added to their number. Now, the significant part of that story isn't just that thousands of people were added. Like, we get hung up on that sometimes, right? But, but we have seen times when thousands of people have raised their hand. We have experienced times when, when lots and lots of people have come forward, even to, even to be baptized. Like, we've seen that before. What's never been seen before isn't just that 3,000 people put their hope in Jesus, but that all of these people in Acts 2, verse 42, devoted themselves They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. They devoted themselves to four things. The apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching eventually got written down. That's what we know of as the New Testament. They devoted themselves to scripture reading, uh, to fellowship, community. That's what we're talking about today. Uh, They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, kind of a euphemism for worship, into prayer. Bible, prayer, community, and fellowship. You could make an argument. You could make a solid case. Like, this is the mark of a Christian today. Bible, prayer, community, and worship. Verse 44. All of the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. We're coming back to that. Verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You may have heard of this passage before in Acts 2, and we can come at it from a lot of different angles. Today we're going to come at it from the angle of community, of intentional kind of community. Because the kind of community that has the capacity, the Jesus sort of capacity to change your life, and even to change the world, as we've seen from this story, is a special kind of community. In fact, it's it's got a few elements together. This is not the kind of community that's just a, a Bible study or a shared hobby or just a community devoted to avoiding a sense of loneliness. This is a God-initiated community that changes our life and even changes the world. It's got three parts in the story, and I'm going to break those down in just a minute. The first part in the story is that it is distinctively Christian. I want you to hear verse 42 again, that they devoted themselves to Bible reading, to prayer, to worshiping together, and to community with Jesus at the center. They devoted themselves. It's this kind of Christian community that is distinctively Christian with Jesus at the center. Now, there's lots of ways that we can find community in the world. 
Uh, a lot of us are a part of a fantasy football league, and that's awesome. I am not against fantasy football, basketball, whatever the deal is. That's great. But what I'm saying, it, it doesn't have the capacity to change our life and change the world. It might keep loneliness at bay just for a little while, but it's not going to change our lives. A lot of us have a group of friends that we can text and go out to brunch with. I love that. Brunch is the best. I don't know why there's any restaurants that exist that aren't brunch for the life of me. However, even brunch doesn't have the capacity to change our life and change the world. Maybe, I, no, no, I'm sticking with it. Even brunch, right? It's this distinctively Christian kind of community. Not the fantasy football league, not the friends that you text when you want to go shopping. It's something more than that. And it's, it's awkward and it's slippery to get into. I mean, that's what Robin, in the testimony that we just heard, that's what she shared. I'm saying, like, but this is tough. You know, it doesn't happen naturally. Like the brunch group, like the fantasy football group, those things just happen organically and naturally. Why does, why does intentional community, why does grouping intentional, why does distinctively Christian community, why does it have to be so hard? Shouldn't it just happen? And we're just going to put it out there and just see if you kind of agree or disagree on the, on the way home. That's fine. But I think... I think an intentionally Christian community necessarily takes a fair amount of work, even like artificial kind of pushing, that it doesn't always happen naturally. And let me explain to you a little bit why I think so. It's because I look at church groups, or I look at the distinctively Christian groups as what could be called a structured community, an intentionally structured community in, in order to accomplish a certain goal. That's why it's not all the time just organic. Sometimes it is, but all the time, especially in churches, it isn't. It's a little bit artificial, sometimes even a little bit forced, because it is a structured community. I'll give you an example of another structured community. Years ago, my daughter wanted to learn soccer. To be completely honest, as parents, we saw a natural athleticism in her, and we wanted her to learn soccer. <laughs> and so we decided to create a structured community just for her. We decided to enter into a relationship, an intentional relationship, with people whom we have really almost nothing in common with. We wouldn't naturally be friends together. We don't particularly live in the same area. But we decided the one thing that we have in common is that all of our girls born in the year 2010 wanted to learn how to become better soccer players together. So we paid the dues. We showed up for the team meetings and the practices. And years later, she is a much better soccer player than she was years ago when we first began. Was it, is it natural to show up to the soccer field at the same place and the time every single week? No. Is it natural to drive all over Michigan and West Michigan to go to these soccer games? No, it's not natural. It's not organic, not in the slightest bit. But does it work in accomplishing the goals that we had set out for? Absolutely. I would love for you to think about church community, this intentional kind of grouping together as a structured community where our shared value is we want to learn how to live and love like Jesus more and more. And if we have to show up to a group where we don't naturally have a lot in common, maybe there's different ages or stages of life or different perspectives, awesome. Let's do that. If it means living out the mission of Jesus more clearly in our lives, we'll put up with it. And it's, sometimes it's going to be awkward, and it's going to be messy. And you're going to show up to the group, and it might not click with everybody there. And by, you might show up next week and the next week, and by the end of the eight weeks or however long it is, you might show up to the group, and it's like, I don't know if I really clicked with very many people at all. Nothing really much happened in the group. This is like the secret. This is the secret of the group. Oftentimes in church groups, nothing really happens in the group. Like there's, there's like eight to 12 individuals. There's usually not a, a huge bearing of the souls in eight weeks of every single person in that group. In fact, if that happens, oftentimes your experience is, well, that was a little weird. No, no, no. It's not necessarily the case that there's this like intentional giant leap forward right up front in the six or eight weeks of the groups, but it's what happens next outside of those groups. You might not have connected with every single person in the group, but but you might have connected with one. You might have had the opportunity, not in that group, but just outside to say, listen, I, you want to get together for coffee? You want to share life just a little bit more? And it's not what happens inside of the group. It's what happens outside of the group that transformation, change starts to take place first with ourselves. 
And then as we live it out, that change begins to impact the entire world. The first mark of groups, the first one, is that it's distinctively Christian. The kind of group that changes lives and changes the world is distinctively Christian. The second mark, (laughs) getting in trouble for this one, is developed in person. Hear me out. Let me build my case. Verse 44, all of the believers were together. Before you email me, okay, on the virtual groups versus in person, I just, uh, I want to I build my case, and then, you can, and then you can respond. But I believe, I think that the text here is showing us that this, um, that this community that changes lives and changes the world is developed better face-to-face than thumbs-to-thumbs. I think that the golden, uh, the golden era of the church gathering together was more than simply a virtual experience. That isn't the end goal that Jesus had in mind. I'll tell you how we use the virtual setting around here is that it is a complement, not a replacement for face-to-face meeting up. So I'm, I'm so thrilled when, when people, we get together like this, we can gather like this. It just, it means the world. And I think over the last couple of years, we've recognized just how incredibly important all of this is as a complement not a replacement. It's a compliment. It's awesome if you have to be away for a little while and you can still catch up, you can still stay in touch with the church. It's a compliment, not a replacement. It's a compliment, especially if you're new and you want to know like what the church is like without like risking showing up in person. I mean, am I going to be welcome? This is a place for me. Is the, is the pastor wear a shirt with little palm trees on it? Then I can go. Or there's no way I'm ever going to go to a church where the pastor wears a shirt with little palm trees on it. I just can't get, get great. That's why we post stuff online so you can kind of like get to know the place before you ever show up to the place. It's a compliment. It's not a replacement for it. Um, I love Instagram. I love social media. Uh, elements of it, at least, are great. Uh, ever since we got a pet rabbit at home uh, about a year and a half ago, my Instagram reels is really just people with their adorable furry animals, and I'm here for it. I absolutely, I love it, especially when people post, like, pictures of their cats, you know, with, like, a scripture verse over it, and it's like, hashtag holy kitty. I mean, it's great. It's Jesus. It's adorable. It's, it's got everything, you know? It's got everything. But again, but again, it's a, it's a compliment, <laughs> Uh, it's not a replacement for the Atlantic magazine did this um, did this article a little ways back. Um, they called it the epidemic of deferred loneliness, and they really built the case that what uh, that what social media does. Like we'll take Instagram as an example. Is when somebody posts something, it, it feels good, right? Especially when people heart it, you know, like it and respond to it. It, feel, it feels good. It feels just for a moment like you're not alone. And I, I love like flipping through, you know, and I and I see like. Pictures of your Yorkshire Terrier dressed up as Chewbacca on Halloween. Thank you, you know, for sharing that with the world. I love it. And I'm going to heart that all day long. I'm going to interact with that and like, yep, let's reward this. Just, you know, keep them coming. This is what I want my feed to be tuned into. You guys' algorithms are going to be all messed up after this. Like, just goofy animals the whole time. But you're welcome. (laughs) Uh, so what the Atlantic found is that when that happens, when we get those hearts, when we get that reaction, it, it moves the loneliness. It doesn't alleviate it. It just pushes it, pushes it away for a moment. It might even push it away for a day. And then we do it the next day, and it pushes it away for another day. And then what happens is that sense of I am, I am doing life alone, and I'm in danger as a result of loneliness and all of those things that come along with it, it's not alleviated. It doesn't go away. We're just not noticing it right now, and so we don't have to deal with it right now. And so that loneliness just stacks up and stacks up. And so we have to keep on doing it. We have to get some attention just to keep the loneliness at bay. And some of you guys right now are going, yeah, yeah, I feel like there is a monster just outside my door. And if I don't feed it with a couple of likes and a couple of online interactions every once in a while, it's going to bust through that door and it's going to take me. And you know that you can't do life alone. The kind of community that transforms lives and even transforms the world. It's distinctively Christian. It's developed in person. And number three, it costs them. Coming back to that line, all the believers had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Um, 
I spent a little while thinking uh, about the passage, a while of my life thinking that like the gateway to coming into the Jesus community at that point was like if you want to sign up for Jesus, you had to liquidate all of your assets, all of your stuff before coming into the community, which seems like a high bar, <laughs> you know, like go across the street, you know, talk to your neighbor. Hey, you want to come to church? First, house goes up for sale, give away everything, and then come and meet Jesus. No, 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 that's, that's, not, the, that's not the story. That wasn't even the story then. The, the word that they sold property and possessions to give, present tense, to anyone who had need, the, the sense of selling that property, sold the property, was like this action with ongoing implication to it. So they sold it and then they kept on selling. So they kept the stuff, but as needs would arise in the Jesus community, they would sell their stuff in order to meet the need. They would liquidate in order to meet the need, which is a pretty wild perspective, I think, and it takes an even greater shift in thinking about the Jesus community and the Jesus worldview and way of life because all of a sudden now, it's not like you don't get to have stuff. No, no, it's deeper than that. You have an entirely different view of your stuff. I'm keeping it. It's mine, but it's no longer serving me. It's serving the cause of Jesus. And if this thing could serve the cause of Jesus better in somebody else's hand as carekeeper, as manager, as temporary steward of the thing, well, I guess, I guess, it, should be, I guess it should be theirs and not mine. The kind of community that changes lives and changes the world costs something. What is your community costing you? We can think about it in terms of like monetary costing for a moment. We can also think about it in terms uh, of relational cost. Does it cost time? Does it, does it cost comfort? Does it cost change? Does it cost a certain kind of potential for rejection? Donald Miller has this book, Scary Close, and in the book he talks about why it's remarkably difficult for him to develop close and meaningful relationships like we heard. And he goes, the reason for him is that, you know, he, we, put up, we put up a mask. Now, now we put up the mask because we know ourselves and we know the dark things in the corridors of our heart. And we don't want other people to see those. We don't want other, other people to expose those things. And so what we do is we put a mask over top. And two things happen as a result. When we wear that mask all the time, all of the praise, all of the affirmation, all of the good things that we do, we don't accept the credit for that. We don't get the blessing from that. No, the mask does. Because we had put the mask up. And so it becomes like a wall. It was meant to keep others out, but now it's a wall keeping ourselves in. And the second thing is the desire is that all of the criticism, all of the complaint, all of the rightful rejections of us don't actually get through to us, but they're just critiquing and they're just, they're making observations about the mask, not me. And so long as we keep the mask up, we can never be criticized. And we can never really be affirmed either. Until one time, a guy took away the mask entirely. Until one time, God himself said, I can shout my love and my strength from heaven. But instead, I'm leading the way by showing my love, connecting here on earth. We impress people through our strengths but we connect with them through our weakness. It shouldn't be lost on us. As we think about the relational cost, the potential for rejection, it shouldn't be lost on us that we serve a God who allowed himself to become obedient to death, even death on a cross, who died hanging naked on a tree to connect to meet us where we are. And when we enter into that group setting and we open ourselves up and we, by the power of God, take that mask off and set it aside just for a moment, what we do in that, in that moment is, is we connect. 
easy to impress people with our strengths, but no, no, connection is done with our weakness. You can't do life alone. You can't do cancer alone. You can't do depression alone. You can't fix a marriage alone. You can't dig yourself out of the financial mess that you got yourself in all alone. You can't do life alone. And at Encounter, like many churches, you don't have to either. We set up a number, 94,000, you can text EC groups, and we'll do our best to put you in one of those structured relationships into one of those groups today, EC groups to 94,000. Anytime during the message, anytime during this last song, 94,000 EC groups. We want you to do life with other people because you can't do life alone. Now listen, there's a trampoline on the stage. And I recognize that. <laughs> and you may have been wondering, what is the deal? When are we going to get to this one? Uh, the answer to that is right now. I got to watch it on this thing because it is all bent up and it is not OSHA approved, but that's okay. I wanted to share that every time we gather here together during this series, um, a picture about what the church is like, what the church could be like at our very, very best. And so part one of the series, Worship, we said, listen, the church at our very, very Jesus best is like this hot coal flame, white hot coal, all together, keeping each other warm. And we take one out, it just fades from white to red to orange to gray to black, right? That's why we got to stay in the, in the fire, keeping each other white hot for Jesus. Last week, serving the teapot, the fine china story. Don't let your greatest gift to the world be hidden away in an attic that was never actually used. Use it. Use your gift for the blessing of the world. And today, we're talking about grouping intentionally, and we're talking about trampolines. This is your answer when somebody says, why do you go to church? You remember when you were a kid, and maybe a neighbor or some kid in the neighborhood had a trampoline? And it was like the best thing. It was also the most dangerous thing in the world as an adult looking at this thing. But like as a kid where you're invincible, it's the best thing in the world. You remember when you start jumping on the trampoline, you know? And if you're by yourself, like that's a lot of fun. But when you jump with somebody and then you get a whole bunch of these kids jumping on the trampoline and somebody else is jumping with you on the trampoline and then they jump and you jump and then they jump and then they land like a split second before you land, and you guys know what happens next. You will jump higher than you have ever jumped in the past. And so you'll jump right back up on the trampoline and try to time it just to make sure that that other kid jumps you and bounces you so high. If you were one of the lucky ones that had the little like ring, you know, the net around the trampoline, you could jump like straight right up out of that trampoline. You could do, you could jump with like superhuman kind of strength. At our Jesus best, we are a kind of community that helps each other bounce. We are a kind of community that will time those bounces to show up in the exact right moment and to lend to offer that bounce, to jump you higher than you have ever jumped before. Or if you are jumping in life and you are out of control and you are caught up in something that you have no business being caught up into and you are living your life on the very, very edge of it. There will be somebody nearby you by the grace of God to take that bounce and to just slow you down and to stop you in the tracks to say, man, you got to reevaluate that. I see the direction you're going on right now. And listen, I'm telling you, you can jump, but when you hit the ground, it's going to hurt. At our Jesus best, the church is a trampoline to help us jump better than we have ever jumped previously. And sometimes we get to see a picture of it, helping each other jump. It's amazing. Right here in our community, there was a gentleman who, uh, who walked out of a, a men's book study. They, they were studying the book, The 10 Second Rule, which is pretty straightforward. I don't know if it needed a whole book, probably like a good paragraph. But The 10 Second Rule is... Uh, 10 second rule is when, when God lays something in your heart and it's, you, you can reasonably believe that it's from Jesus, that it honors him, do it within the first 10 seconds or you're not going to do it at all. Just be obedient. Be obedient to God's leading in that way. And so this, uh, this gentleman walks out of the group and he's, 
commitment. I'm going to do it. I'm going to listen to Jesus, the 10-second rule, within 10 seconds. And he goes out of church. He's worshiping at Encounter Fulton Heights, and, and he meets a guy several, <clears throat> say this delicately, several decades his junior, right? And there's a lot of barriers there. There's a lot of, like, intimidation on both sides. Like, do I connect to this person? Can I? And he just senses this nudging. Like, maybe I should invite the guy out, you know? Hey, I recognize yeah. You want to get a cup of coffee sometime? Just get to know each other a little bit more? The younger guy's like, yeah, I'd love to. And so they, they end up having coffee. They end up having another coffee and another coffee. They end up having a book study, which turns into a Bible study. About a year, almost a year and a half later, last weekend at Encounter Fulton Heights, Bernie, the gentleman on the left of the picture, got to read Josh's testimony as he goes under the water and celebrates the fact that he's going public with his face. We got a next picture of him coming out of the water, soaking wet with his declaration that the death of Jesus benefits him and he's planning on spending eternity with him. Can we recognize this guy? Can we recognize Josh and Bernie? Last weekend, this is a picture of helping each other jump. Regardless of the barriers, regardless of the generational difference, the several decades in between, we're helping each other jump. At our Jesus best, it's what the church does. Let's pray together. Jesus, the church is your idea. And sometimes we show up and sometimes we bump into each other and sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes we simplify it just to a social group or a place to find friends. God, it can be those things, but it doesn't. But it shouldn't be. It should be something so much more. It should be distinctively Christian gathered around your name. God, it should be done face-to-face, -face, sharing life together. God, it should be done with an element of cost and sacrifice. That we are all in for you, Jesus because you went all in for us first. Jesus, we pray all of this in your resurrected name. Amen.